so there's a debate. There's, um, there's a debate over women's and men's domestic violence. And we've always known that both women and men uh, can be violent and both women and men are capable of using violence. But at the same time, um, at the same time, uh, domestic violence has largely been seen as a problem largely of violence by men uh, against women and children. And I should, I should say quickly, of course, most men, aren't you, you know, most men aren't violent. Most men in their intimate relations, their family relations, don't use violence. But when violence happens, when a woman is living with violence by a partner, living with violence in her families, typically the assailant is male. But um, there's a very different understanding of domestic violence that's now emerging. Uh, an understanding of domestic violence where domestic and family violence is seen as gender equal or gender neutral. And so I'm going to assess that claim. I'm going to look at the claim that there's kind of gender symmetry uh, in domestic violence. And I'm going to highlight some of the real contrasts, in fact, between women's and men's experiences of domestic violence. But look, let's start with, let's start with language. And uh, you know, when we use the phrase domestic violence, um, we, have to, we have to think about issues of power and control. When it comes to domestic violence, we're talking about a pattern of behaviours, a pattern of behaviours linked by power and control. And the work that the women and men in this room do and the women and men around Australia do in relation to domestic violence tells us that when a man, for example, is using violence against his partner in a relationship, in a family, Typically, he's using a range of other abusive and controlling strategies as well. And in fact, uh, there are some circumstances where a man is controlling and abusing and putting down his partner, but he's not using physical violence at all. Um, and so the term domestic violence refers to that, that systematic pattern of power and control, a systematic pattern of power and control exerted by one person against another um, in the context of a, an intimate relationship. And so, if you like, that's domestic violence in the strong sense, domestic violence proper. And so it's worth highlighting that domestic <coughs> violence is a kind of chronic behaviour. And it's characterised not by the, the physical violence that punctuates the relationship, but by the emotional and psychological abuse and social control that the perpetrator is using to maintain control over his partner. And many of you will be familiar with uh, this, you know, the image of kind of coercive controlling violence, the Duluth power and control wheel, which is now being taken up by people like Evan Stark, Michael Johnson and others, um, to highlight exactly that pattern of power and control. Um, but uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of this debate, um, you know, who are the perpetrators then? If that's what domestic violence is, if domestic violence is a systematic power, pattern of power and control, who are the perpetrators? There's a claim that uh, there's a claim that's increasingly prominent um, in Australia in community debates in public policy that men are a significant proportion of victims that men are one third or one quarter of the of the victims of domestic or family violence, and one of the most vocal uh, proponents of that claim is a group called Men's Health Australia their their campaign one in three, and the related claim of course is that women are a significant proportion of perpetrators of violence. Um, and people in the community will say this too. People in the community, and I know this happens in Mackay and elsewhere, will say, what about women's violence against men? What about, um, what about male victims of violence and so on? And there's also academic support for this idea. There's academic support uh, for, um, for this idea, for this idea that there's some kind of gender symmetry when it comes to domestic violence. And basically you've got two bodies of scholarship. On the one hand, you've got family conflict studies. Family conflict studies focus, as the name suggests, on conflict. Conflict in married couples, heterosexual couples. And they measure aggressive <coughs> behaviour. They measure aggressive behaviour in couples. Typically they find gender symmetries, roughly equal amounts of perpetration by men and women. On the other hand, so you've got family conflict studies. On the other hand, um, you've got feminist studies, crime victimisation studies and other data that find gender asymmetries, marked gender asymmetries or inequalities, kind of you know, not like this, but like that, where men are assaulting their partners and ex-partners at rates many times um, the rate at which women assault their partners and female victims greatly outnumber male victims. So even in academic scholarship, there's debate. And so for simplicity's sake, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to label the argument that men are a significant proportion of victims, half or one third or one quarter, as gender symmetry, 
arguments. Not all of them say it's 50-50, some of them say it's 25-75, you know, but I'm going to call them all gender symmetry arguments, because they all emphasise male victims and female perpetrators. Okay, so what about the data? Um, you know, what's, what's the data actually suggest? Um, so, you know, sort of figure out, to figure out who are the victims, who are the perpetrators of domestic violence, we need data. And uh, we need data about the kinds of violence they experience, its impact, its severity, and so on. The problem is that the data we've got in Australia aren't necessarily very good at telling us that. The most prominent source of data is uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, ABS, Personal Safety Survey, National Survey of Victimisation Among Men and Women. And so the, um, the Personal Safety Survey um, basically asks people uh, if they've ever experienced one of a number of physically aggressive acts. It asks, it asks you know, men and women, um, have you ever been pushed or grabbed or shoved by your partner or ex-partner? Have you ever been slapped or kicked or bitten? Have you been hit with something else? Were you stabbed? Were you shot? And so on. So it asks about a series of physical acts. What it comes up with is the numbers um, that are on uh, the, the PowerPoint, which is that um, in Australia in the last year, 94,000 people, 73,800 women and 21,200 men experienced at least one, at least one incident of physical assault by a current or a previous partner, an other sex partner, because the numbers for same sex partners were too small to record, um, at least one incident uh, of physical assault by a, by a current or previous partner in the last 12 months. So 94,000 people in Australia experienced at least you know, one of those things. And if you look at the sex breakdown, uh, uh, women were 78% of those um, 94,000 people, men were 22% of, um, of those people. And so, and the numbers would be slightly different, the, the proportion of women would be higher if we also included sexual assault, because the numbers of female victims of sexual assault greatly outweighs the number of male victims uh, among adults. So if you take these figures at face value, men are 22%, one in five, of the victims of domestic violence in Australia. Now I'm going to say at length why I think that's not true, but that's certainly what organisations like Men's Health Australia do. They say men are one in five of the victims, in this case of, you know, adult domestic violence. And so, so, you know, they take these figures at face value. Sometimes, so do domestic violence advocates ourselves. So, for example, I've done this. I've, I've said over 70,000 women in the last year were living with domestic violence by a partner or an ex-partner. So I've taken that number, that, you know, that, um, whatever it was, 70, let's have a look, 73,000 women, and said, you know, that's how many women in Australia are living with domestic violence. The problem is that's not necessarily true. The problem is that the, the way domestic violence is defined and measured in this personal safety survey is really limited. So, you know, so how, how is it limited? Um, it's, it's limited because it's focused on violent acts. It's focused on, you know, have you been slapped? Have you been kicked? And so on. And, and so if we make claims about domestic violence, we're making claims about the numbers of men and women who've experienced one of those violent acts. Just to be clear, those violent acts aren't okay. I'm not saying, oh, you know, these things don't matter. Um, but that's different from saying, that's different from making claims about the numbers of men and women living with a pattern of power and control by their male partner, or living in fear, or suffering injury, and so on. So what's going on here is some limitations to do with an acts focused approach, an approach that's focused on counting violent acts or counting the blows, in other words. And one of the most common methods for doing this is the conflict tactic scale. And I'm going to say a little bit about the conflict tactic scale because it's the main measure that's used in the many studies that find gender symmetry. People like Men's Health Australia can point to academic scholarship that says men and women are using violence at equal rates. When they do that, they're almost always using studies based on the conflict tactic scale. So this is an excursion into method, into how we measure domestic violence. And we need to do this if we have to understand and make sense of claims about women's and men's um, violence. So, so we'll talk about the conflict tactic scale. The conflict tactic scale, as it says on the slide, is the source of most claims to gender symmetry. It's focused on counting the blows. It comes out of that school of research called Family Conflict Studies. Um, it asks one person in a relationship, doesn't ask separated people, only people in intact relationships, 
whether they or their spouse have ever committed any of a series of violent acts. So exactly that kind of thing. Have you ever been slapped? Have you ever been kicked? And so on. And they generally find gender symmetry. But there are some problems. There are some real problems with the conflict tactics scale. And in fact, I've got a lengthy slide on this. I'll, um, I'll sort of, as you can see, I'm bouncing back and forward between the two, but we'll see how we go. The most serious problem with the conflict tactics scale is it doesn't get information. It doesn't gather information about the intensity of the violence, the context for the violence, or the consequences or meaning of the violence. It doesn't tell us, for example, whether that slap or that hit or that punch was a one-off. Did it happen once in the last year? Or was it part of a pattern of violence? It doesn't ask <coughs> who initiated the violence. Were you responding to violence by your partner? It assumes that violence comes out of anger, comes out of emotion, rather than violence being used <coughs> deliberately and carefully to achieve certain goals. It omits a series of violent acts. It leaves out things like sexual abuse and stalking. And obviously it leaves out intimate homicide. It can't ask people, have you ever been killed by your partner? Um, and it ignores the history of violence in the relationship. It ignores or neglects questions of injury. Um, and, and I'll say a bit more about uh, the conflict tactic scale in a minute. So that's, that's one key problem with the conflict tactic scale, is it fails to ask about a series of things to do with, um, to do with violence. Uh, its impact, its meaning, its consequences and so on. Another problem is that it relies just on reports either by the male partner or the female partner. And the problem is men and women disagree. Men and women disagree about the violence they've experienced. This is the problem that I've described there as poor interspousal reliability. Um, and um, the evidence is that wives and husbands disagree considerably over the violence they've experienced. The evidence is, in fact, that wives are more likely than husbands to admit to their own violence. And I'll come back to this in a little while. Another problem with the conflict tactics scale is to do with its sample, to do with who it actually asks. If you're a woman living with uh, domestic violence in the true sense, living with you know, a serious pattern of power and control by your male partner, you're likely to refuse to take part in a survey for various obvious reasons. Likewise, if you're a man using serious violence against your female partner, you're also not going to be very likely to tell all to a telephone interviewer or a face-to-face -face interviewer about the violence you're experiencing. And there's evidence that people living with uh, domestic violence have high rates of refusal, whether they're perpetrating or suffering domestic violence. And so you end up with a sample that doesn't include anyone who's living with those forms of violence. And finally, CTS studies, conflict tactic scale studies, uh, leave out violence after separation and divorce. We know that separation and divorce are some of the riskiest times for women um, when, it comes to, when it comes to violence. So just to, just to sort of spell this out and what this means. Um, let's say that I've been systematically abusing my female partner over the last year. I've been hitting her, I've been putting her down, I've been forcing her into sex, I've been controlling her movements and so on. In other words, I'm a perpetrator of domestic violence. And in the midst of one of my violent and controlling attacks on her, she threw an object at me and hit me in the head, or she, she slapped me back or pushed me back. My various strategies of power and control have left her bruised, battered, emotionally, emotionally kind of subjugated, and her one act of self-defense just made me laugh. You know, I shrugged it off, I ducked. According to the conflict tactic scale, though, we've both committed violence. In fact, we've both committed severe violence, because throwing objects counts as severe violence. And so the CTS counts us as equivalent. It misses what's actually going on. And that would be true if I was the real victim. That would be true if it was my female partner who'd been systematically abusing and controlling me, and I had once hit back or thrown an object. Again, the CTS would miss what's going on. It's crappy either way. Um, now, uh, the conflict tactics scale has been around for a few decades. It was revised in 1996. The CTS 2 came along. It now asks about sexual coercion, for example. So some people say, oh no, the revised CTS is much better. It deals with all these problems. But most studies using the conflict tactics scale still use the old one. The, most of them don't include the new questions on sexual violence. And in fact, the new questions on sexual violence aren't very good anyway. So it's got real limits. So just to go back to... Um, the, the slide, the conflict tactic scale ends up producing the very claim it's meant to test. 
It's meant to test whether women and men are equally violent and equally victims, but because of the way it's designed, it misses the patterns of violence that are going on and just ends up producing claims of symmetry or equivalence because it treats violence in such a kind of decontextualised and abstract way. And in fact, even in CTS studies, even in CTS studies, while they find roughly similar numbers of men and women are using violence, using any of those violent acts, they also find, if they do ask about fear and injury, that women are much more likely to be uh, afraid, women have higher rates of injury than men. So even the CTS-based studies, if they ask about fear and injury, find that men's violence against women is more serious. More injuries, produces more fear, um, and so on. So the personal safety survey tells us something. It tells us the numbers of men and women who've experienced at least one physical act of aggression by a partner, but it doesn't tell us much else. It doesn't tell us much about its meaning, its impact, um, its character, and so on. At least the published data doesn't show us this. Um, and so, for example, if we think about impact, if we want to know about impact, it's, uh, we know that women will often see the emotional impact of physical violence as more important than the physical impact. Yes, there were bruises or there were cuts or there were broken bones, but it was the emotional impact that was more long-lasting and more crippling. And some women report that it's the non-physical tactics of abuse and control, uh, having the movements controlled, having their self-esteem shattered, having property destroyed, having children threatened and so on. Some women report that it's that non-physical tactics that are more, more damaging, more threatening than the physical violence itself. <coughs> So, um, so, we've got this problem of how we measure and define different forms of violence. And I've mentioned already that other bodies of data, crime data, hospital data and so on, finds gender asymmetries, finds real gender asymmetries in, um, in men's and women's experiences of violence. One way of making sense of this, one way of making sense of these different patterns is, is in terms of uh, different types of violence, in terms of the idea that there are actually different types of violence going on and these different methods are picking up on different patterns of violence in men's and women's relationships. And so if we go back to, to the kind of model of domestic violence I first described, a systematic pattern of power and control, then in a sense, um, you know, kind of classic domestic violence, domestic violence in a strong sense, one way of understanding that is in terms of intimate terrorism. And um, a guy called Michael Johnson has done some work on different patterns of violence. And he names three patterns of violence. One of those is intimate terrorism, it's what he first called it, or now coercive controlling violence. And that's a situation where you've got a violent perpetrator using violence and a series of other controlling tactics um, to try to take control over their partner. And so in coercive controlling violence, you've got one partner, and it's usually the man, according to the research, is using violence and other controlling tactics to assert or to restore power and authority over, over his female partner. And so there are a few things that distinguish um, intimate terrorism. The violence tends to be more severe. It's asymmetrical, it's uneven. It's instrumental, that is, it's being used deliberately as a strategy. It tends to get worse over time, and injuries are more likely. So, for example, when domestic violence advocates say, you know, domestic violence tends to escalate, tends to get worse, um, Johnson would say, yes, that's true for this type of violence, for intimate terrorism. Another type of violence, though, is situational couple violence, where, um, and that's a very different pattern of violence. He first called this common couple violence, now he calls it situational couple violence. Some heterosexual couples um, have conflicts, surprise, surprise, and those conflicts sometimes lead to um, verbal aggression, stuff you, no stuff you, and then to physical aggression, um, a slap or a kick or, or a punch or something. What distinguishes situational couple violence is it's coming out of situations of conflict. It's relatively minor violence. Again, I should say, you know, no violence is okay. I, I don't think a slap is okay. I don't think any kind of violence is okay. But there's a particular pattern here. The violence is minor. It's practiced by both partners, by both the man and the woman. It's coming out of emotion rather than being used deliberately to, you know, as a strategy of control. It tends not to get worse over time. It tends not to escalate and escalate. And the injuries are rare. So in other words, situational couple violence, you don't have that pattern of control. You don't have that pattern of control um, that characterises the, the first, intimate terrorism. The third pattern, though, um, is... Uh, 
is what, um, what Michael Johnson calls violent resistance. And that's where um, sometimes a woman is living with an intimate terrorist and is using violence in response, in retaliation or self-defence and so on. So you've got a kind of a more complex pattern, if you like, where a woman is violently resisting her male partner's violent and controlling behaviour. So three patterns, intimate terrorism, situational couple violence and violent resistance. And what Johnson argues is that if you look at general surveys, if you look at um, the sort of general surveys, then it's situational couple violence that dominates survey data. Um, so the, the 90,000 men and women who experienced at least one physical act of aggression by a, by a partner, most of that, Johnson would say, is situational couple violence. And that's partly because of those high rates of refusal by intimate terrorists and their victims. Intimate, intimate terrorists aren't taking part in those surveys and neither are their victims. So studies using the conflict tactic scale pick up on situational couple violence. They pick up on these kind of low levels of mutual violence in heterosexual couples. They miss part of what's going on, but they pick up on that. So they're poor at measuring situational couple violence. They're poorer still when it comes to intimate terrorism. So that's what general surveys tend to find, situational couple violence. Whereas if you go to refuges or you go to hospitals or you look at police data, you find more intimate terrorism and violent resistance. You find more of the kind of classic forms of domestic violence that domestic violence advocates have been talking about for a long time. So look, if, if Johnson is right, then when we go back to the personal safety survey, I said we've got 94,000 people, 70 plus thousand women, 22,000 men who've experienced at least one act of physical aggression. Johnson would say that most of those people are living with situational couple violence. And in fact, he's gone back and looked at large scale surveys, um, large scale surveys in other countries and has tried to kind of dig down into that data and figure out what's going on. Are they living in fear? <coughs> uh, is the violence severe? Is there a pattern of control or is it something else? And various studies, four different studies in, in a number of countries, find that up to that between 75 and 89 percent of the violence being um, uh, discovered is situational couple violence. So three quarters of it is situational couple violence. So if we go back to the, the personal safety survey, then if Johnson is right, then three quarters of the intimate partner violence in the personal safety survey is situational couple violence. Um, and so, um, if Johnson is right, about three quarters of the women uh, who experienced at least one incident of physical violence are living with situational couple violence, and one quarter, about 18,000 women, are living with intimate terrorism. So where, when I used to say 70,000 women in Australia are living with intimate terrorism, I have to now say 18,000 women are living with intimate terrorism, not 70,000. And because about one quarter of the women who've experienced any kind of physical violence by a male partner are living with intimate terrorism. Among male victims, it's not one quarter though. There were 21,000 men who experienced at least one act of physical aggression. Um, only about 5 or 10% of, of those men, according to other data, are living with intimate terrorism. So of all the men who've experienced at least one act of physical aggression, um, maybe 5 or 10% are living with intimate terrorism terrorism, about 1,000 or 2,000 um, men. So if this is accurate, there are about 19 to 20,000 people in Australia living with domestic violence in the true sense. Domestic violence, um, you know, in the sense that it's been argued by domestic violence advocates, intimate terrorism, coercive control, 20,000 people, and 90 or 95 percent of those are women. Okay, so that's, that's, you know, if Johnson is right, then that's really what's going on. Um, rather than a simplistic idea that men are one quarter of the victims of domestic violence. Now, I haven't looked at the ABS data. I haven't looked at the unpublished ABS data to try to figure this out, to try to figure out if this is actually true, but this is what I'm actually planning to do. I'm planning to commission the ABS to dig down into that data, to find out, okay, of those women and men, how many lived in fear? What proportion were injured? What proportion lived with other strategies of control and coercion as well as experiencing physical violence? In other words, to try to figure out you know, what proportion of the men and women who experienced some kind of physical aggression by a partner, they were slapped or they were kicked or something, what proportion of those are living with intimate terrorism? 
Okay, but there is a whole lot of other data. There's some data in the personal safety survey and there's a whole lot of other data that tells us that there are real contrasts, real contrasts in women's and men's experiences of um, domestic violence, particularly, and I'm focused here on intimate partner violence, on violence by uh, an adult against their intimate partner or ex-partner. There are my numbers on intimate terrorism, um, we're saying that women are 90 to 95 percent of victims, and there are, this slide is a kind of summary of some contrast, some contrast between women's and men's experiences of domestic violence. The first, one of the first things to say isn't on that slide, which is that um, when it comes to violence in general, men are often the victims of violence. In fact, most victims of assault are male. Most victims of homicide are male in Australia. And they're overwhelmingly at risk of violence from other men. There's a real contrast in women's and men's experiences of violence in general. Men are most at risk of violence <laughs> from men, that's actually the same as women. Both women and men are both most at risk of violence from men, but men are most at risk of violence from men they don't know. Women are most at risk of violence from men they do know. Um, and violence against women is more likely than violence against men to take place in families and relationships. In fact, if you look at, if you look at uh, all women who are victims of physical assault, the category of perpetrator, the biggest category of perpetrator, is partners and ex-partners. Uh, it's 31%. It's just above some other categories. So, women of women who are physically assaulted, women are most likely to have been assaulted by a partner or ex-partner, whereas men are most likely to have been assaulted by a male stranger. So, there's a real contrast um, in women's and men's experiences of violence in general. But um, there are some other contrasts too. Focusing on intimate partner violence, on violence between uh, husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends and so on, women are more likely to experience frequent, prolonged and extreme violence. Uh, and that's true in the personal safety survey, it's true from other studies as well. When women are, suffer violence compared to when men suffer violence by a partner, women's violence tends to be more frequent, to go on for longer, to be more extreme. Another contrast is to do with sexual violence. Domestic violence is, often goes along with sexual violence, and in fact some definitions of domestic violence include sexual violence, and I think that's a good idea. One, one gender contrast is women are far more likely than men to be sexually assaulted by an intimate partner. So um, in the personal safety survey, for example, 29,000 women had been sexually assaulted in the last 12 months by a male partner or a previous partner, whereas there were no figures on sexual assaults against men by female partners or ex-partners, basically because the numbers are too low. Um, and then among adult victims of any kind of intimate partner violence, sexual violence is more common for female victims than male victims. So even if you just focus on the men who are victims of violence by a female partner, sexual violence is still pretty rare among those men, compared to among the women who are victims of violence by a partner. So that's, that's a contrast. Another contrast is to do, with, to do with impact, to do with the impact of these different kinds of violence. Um, and so there are clear gender contrasts when it comes to fear, for example. Women are far more likely than men to fear, to live in fear, to, to fear for their lives uh, in terms of violence from an intimate partner. Women are far more likely than men to sustain injuries. So putting that the other way around, when men are assaulted, physically assaulted by female partners, they're less likely to be injured and they're less likely to fear for their safety than women assaulted by male partners. And it's a consistent finding. It's a consistent finding from hospital records, from domestic violence programs, from police arrests of, you know, often, uh, increasingly in the US, there's a dual arrest where both the woman and the man are arrested by police. And from, from those records and from other data, it's a consistent finding that men's violence against women has more serious consequences than women's violence against men in terms of physical injury, in terms of psychological harms like depression and anxiety, and in terms of fear. And that's true of the Australian studies, the various Australian studies we can find as well. And in fact, there's been some really interesting research digging down into this digging down into women's and men's experiences of violence. There was a study among British couples, for example. And first off, uh, the, the authors of the study used the conflict tactic scale. And surprise, surprise, they found that women and men were perpetrating violence, according to the conflict tactic scale, at similar levels. So they could have said, oh, domestic violence is 50-50. What they then did, though, is they went back and interviewed. They went back and interviewed the men and women about 
uh, about their experiences of violence. And what they found was a gender contrast that the CTS had missed. A gender contrast in the character of the violence, the impact of the violence, the history of the violence, and so on. They found, for example, that women who were living with violence by their male partners were much more likely than the men to feel frightened, to feel helpless, to feel trapped, and so on. Whereas the men who were, who were, who'd experienced physical aggression by their female partners, lots of them, they said, I'm not bothered by it. Or they thought it was trivial or laughable. Or they thought good honour for fighting back when I'm abusing her. Um, they saw it as laughable, ludicrous, even admirable, and so on. So there was a real gender contrast that the CTS hadn't missed. And a gen so, in other words, a gender contrast in impact. Now, having said that, there's no doubt, some men do live with intimate terrorism by their female partners. There's been some research, for example, among men who call a domestic violence helpline for male domestic violence victims in the US. And some of those men were living with what you might call intimate terrorism and being subjected to a, right, a range of forms of power and control by their female partners. So I've not, got no doubt um, some men are victims of intimate terrorism by female partners, it's just rare. Um, and in fact, there was a WA study, uh, again, a self-selected sample of men. Some of those men were living with what, what you might call intimate terrorism. But you can't use that to say that there's some kind of wider equality in women's and men's experience. Um, okay, back to, the, back to the slide. One of the things, um, one, of the, one of the claims made here is, um, oh, you know, there's... Women show more fear, you know, there are high levels of fear among women because women are socialised to show fear. Men are socialised not to show fear and so, you know, that's why you get higher levels of fear among women than men um, because it's about, it's about gender socialisation. But the evidence is that that's not true. The evidence is that women's higher levels of fear reflect higher levels of violence. And so, for example, um, uh, there, there was a study among uh, Italian university students and, you know, like many of these studies, it showed that women living with violence from male partners had higher levels of injury, higher levels of fear than men living with violence um, from, fe from female partners. And the researchers dug down into this and documented that the reason women had higher levels of fear was not because they had a stronger reaction to the same violence. It's not just, oh, women are more vulnerable, more fragile, so they react more strongly to the same levels of violence as men. It's, in fact, the violence was worse. The violence was more severe, more threatening, more dangerous, and so on. Um, and so, in other words, women's uh, greater levels of fear reflect greater levels of violence. Another contrast is to do with why women stay, um, why women and men stay. Women and men stay may stay with violent, per violent partners for similar reasons, um, uh, but there are, also, uh, there are also reasons that are different. Women are more likely to stay because of financial dependency. Okay, I'm going to talk about perpetration briefly, some, some contrasts in perpetration. There are some gender contrasts in perpetration too. Um, talked about those. Um, so there are differences in the motivations and the nature of women's and men's uses of violence. Women's physical violence towards male partners is much more likely than men's violence to be in self-defence. It's more likely to be reactive to violence by male partners. Um, women's violence towards male partners is more likely to be protective, sorry, self-protective and reactive than the reverse. And the motivations are different too. Men are more likely than women to say that they're using violence to achieve certain sorts of goals. To, to get her to stop nagging, to stop her um, you know, being such a slut and so on. Whereas women are more likely to describe emotional reasons, um, self-defence and so on. So there's a contrast. There are also contrasts in the predictors of men's and women's violence and uh, uh, contrasts in um, the kinds of attitudes that go along with men's and women's violence. Okay. Now, groups like Men's Health Australia say that one reason there's such an apparent contrast in women's and men's experiences of violence are to do with reporting. They claim that, look, men under-report, and that's why we don't see this epidemic of husband battering, um, you know, in the data, in police records and so on. But the evidence is that's not true. The evidence is, as you know, that women also under-report, and in fact... Um, the evidence is that men are more likely to report their use of... Sorry, men are less likely to report their use of violence than women are to report theirs. 
So one gender contrast is men underreport their own use of violence more than women do, and women um, women underreport their own victimisation more than men do. So the data on reporting doesn't show the kinds of contrasts um, that um, that have been described. So, for example, um, there's some evidence that um, that when it comes to victims, male and female victims. Uh, men are more likely to report than female victims. Um, some studies show that they're equally likely. A few studies show that women are more likely, but certainly many studies show that men are more likely to report the victimisation they've experienced. So it's not under-reporting. These gender contrasts are not the kind of outcome of reporting differences. OK, let's move on to the final section of my talk, which is on anti-feminist backlash. Now, in Australia, as elsewhere, there's been a real backlash against efforts to name and address men's violence against women. And it's come particularly from men's and fathers' rights groups. And there's a few ways in which these groups show that they're not motivated by a genuine concern for male victimisation. First, they focus on violence, by, um, violence to men by women, whereas the great majority of the violence men experience is by other men. Second, um, Fathers' rights and men's rights groups, like the Men's Rights uh, Agency in Queensland and other groups, have tried to wind back the protections available to victims. Protection orders, pro-arrest policies and so on. And they've tried to boost the freedoms and the rights of alleged perpetrators. And if they were successful, then female victims would suffer, but so would male victims. Male victims would have less access to protection orders. Their perpetrators wouldn't be arrested and so on. And finally, they've attacked domestic violence services. They've, they've attacked the very services that, that respond to female and male victims alike. But I want to talk in particular about one group that's become increasingly prominent, and that's the group Men's Health Australia and its One in Three campaign. It describes itself as a campaign for male victims of family violence. But I think if we look at its activities and its agendas, it's more accurately described as a campaign against efforts to address men's violence against women. It draws only on those family conflict studies. It doesn't even acknowledge that there's debate in the academic literature about different ways of understanding violence. And it's an anti-feminist campaign. Its content and its agendas are anti-feminist. It's tied to anti-feminist men's groups. And it acts in opposition to feminist groups. It's careful to avoid the kind of hostile and anti-feminist rhetoric that other men's groups use. But there's no doubt it's anti-feminist. So just to make a brief critique of one in three. One in, three says, um, one in three says it's concerned about male, um, about male family violence, but it neglects violence against males in families by other males. Most of the violence men in families experience is by other men. It's by their dads, their uncles, their brothers, their sons, and so on. Second, um, Men's Health Australia says we're concerned about men's health and well-being, but it ignores the major threat to men's health and well-being, which is violence by other men, not violence by women. Third, it uses the term family violence in some dodgy ways. It uses the term family violence in ways that slide between two, two kinds of violence. It, there's male victims of family violence broadly defined, male victims of violence by uncles, brothers and so on, and then there's male victims of intimate partner violence, adult men being assaulted by their female partners. It uses statistics about one, sometimes as if those statistics about the other. One in three also tries to de-gender violence. It says, oh yes, there's community tolerance for violence against women, and fails to mention that the biggest factor shaping community attitudes towards violence against women is gender, is you know, a gender contrast in attitudes. And finally, it plays a spoiler role. It plays a spoiler role in, um, in, in, in um, trying to attack and undermine campaigns against men's violence against women. You know, typically, before November 25th each year, the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, just before the day, Men's Health Australia comes out with some kind of attack on the campaigns that, um, that are, you know, that are happening on that day. And, you know, implying that men's violence against women is uh, um, matched by women's violence against men. Okay, I want to finish. Um, I want to finish by coming back to what we've done, where, we, where we've got to. It's a lie. It's a lie to claim that large numbers of men in Australia are suffering abuse at the hands of their, of their wives and female partners. 
saying that is a distraction. It's a monumental distraction from the real needs of male victims of violence, of domestic violence and family violence, and it undermines support for male and female victims alike. If we think of domestic violence not just as isolated violent acts, but if, if we think of domestic violence as a pattern of power and control, then women are 90 to 95% of victims. This, this has some implications. Some of them are troubling implications. One implication is we have to revise downwards. We have to lower our claims regarding the numbers of women in Australia living with intimate terrorism or coercive controlling violence. But what we don't have to do is change the claim that coercive controlling violence, domestic violence proper, if you like, is perpetrated largely by men and experienced largely by women. When it comes to domestic violence between adults, we should continue to focus on violence by men against women. And we should devote most service responses and policy responses to that. At the same time, we have to address violence by men. I would love to see a major campaign on violence against men in Australia, and it would be about violence against men by other men, because that's, that's most of what's going on. We have to pay attention to the, to the detail of women's and men's experiences of victimisation and perpetration. Otherwise, we're going to commit three errors. If we don't pay attention to women's and men's experience, we'll commit an error of fact. We'll fail to recognise the true pattern, the true pattern of women's and men's um, uh, experience. We'll commit errors of theory. We'll be unable to explain what's going on, domestic and family violence. We'll be unable to identify the social and the structural causes of that violence. And third, we'll commit errors of intervention. We'll, if we don't pay attention to women's and men's, um, to the realities of women's and men's experiences, will adopt forms of intervention which are inappropriate, which are ineffective, and indeed, which are dangerous. And if we do that, if we fail to pay attention to the realities of women's and men's experiences, we'll fail both female and male victims. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Michael. I think, you know, the purpose of these seminars is to translate uh, research into uh, practice wisdom and so the people in the in our audience can, can make sense of the vast literature that's out there and you've done that superbly so I want to thank you. Before we go to questions I want to take the opportunity to say thank you um, to you to, for being here, making the time, doing the work that you do because we may in fact uh, drop some people out before we get to, to do that publicly so I wanted to say that. Um, but we will now take questions from uh, external sites. Well, Heather, can you hear me? Yes. Someone from Rockhampton? Uh, no? No, it's Rosemary from the Gold Coast, from the Domestic Violence Prevention Centre. Hello, Rosemary. Gold Coast. So, um, just wondering, we recently went to New York and witnessed the um, specialist DV courts there. And one of the questions we asked the judges there was, what's so good about having a specialist DV court? And the answer was, it, it helps us to decide really quickly whether it's situational couple violence or to domestic violence. And I'm just wondering a couple of things, I guess. The dangers inherent in making those decisions quickly, and what sort of tools are available to, to really get the information that you need to assess at um, judiciary and perhaps police officers to make that call um, when they attend to see that it's, it's situational couple violence or intimate terrorism. But that's a, that's a great question and you know, Michael Johnson and others who are working on kind of more complex and richer accounts of uh, patterns of domestic violence acknowledge that, that what that needs to flow on into is to police and service and legal responses. And certainly uh, you know, I know enough to know that one size doesn't fit all, that, um, that service responses and policy responses need to respond in different ways to these different kinds of violence because of the, the risks of harm and injury are different, the dynamics are different, the likely of recidivism, of reoffending is different and so on. Having said that, um, you know, I, I don't have the expertise to comment on exactly how police and other agencies can make those differentiations, but certainly I think that, you know, that's what's next, is that the kinds of risk assessment tools, the diagnostic tools that already are, you know, um, in place for police, for service workers and others, will need to be further developed to, to make sense of these different kinds of violence. And certainly we shouldn't apply Johnson's typology of you know, two or three types of violence in some simplistic way. 
um, you know, we have to continue to listen to those women and indeed men themselves and listen to the complexity of their experience. Um, yeah, that's, that's as much as I can say. Um, sorry, Mark, just, just one other question. The data is getting it wrong in terms of you know, misidentifying intimate um, terrorism for a situation of couple violence. That, that's obvious. What are the dangers of getting it wrong the other way and identifying intimate terrorism instead of it should be sexual and couple violence? That's the first part of my question. Are there any dangers in that? And secondly, we're going to talk about these two, two types. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. That might well be the case that the um, true domestic violence is a lot lower than we previously thought. Should we be running different programs and different men's programs to address both types of um, domestic violence? Yep. Just, just on the dangers, I mean, two obvious dangers that I can think of straight away are um, uh, people, typically women, being arrested um, as domestic violence offenders and then being you know, mandated to domestic violence programs when the violence they're perpetrating uh, is you know, relatively low-level violence without fear, without injury and so on. It doesn't mean it's okay or acceptable. It's, you know, it's unacceptable, um, you know, it's, it's abusive behaviour, but... Um, police and criminal responses for one type of violence, where there are high, um, where the violence is likely to escalate, there are high levels of fear and injury, and you know risks to children and so on, being applied to another form of violence that doesn't have those same risks. So being arrested, being convicted, being uh, you know put through police and criminal justice programs that are that simply don't reflect what's going on. That's one obvious danger. Another danger is then going to a batterer program, a batterer intervention program or perpetrator program, which is um, addressing you as if you're invested in controlling and abusing your partner, as indeed some perpetrators are, whereas in fact the violence you're describing is better addressed in some other way, dare I say it, through um, you know, more emotional or couples counselling or mediation responses. I mean, they're, they're very risky when it comes to intimate terrorism, kind of classic domestic violence. So your, answer, your question was, what happens if we treat, what are the dangers if we treat some episodes of situational couple violence as intimate terrorism? There are a few, it seems to me. Um, yeah, that, that's enough, I think. Mm, okay, thanks. We might go to another location if there's a question from Bundaberg. Can you hear Melbourne? Yeah, we can hear you, Melbourne. Come on, go ahead. <laughs> Michael, um, you mentioned that you want to get more information from the ABS so that you can unpack that data and <coughs> that information going to be available, will they be able to provide that to you? And when do you feel you'll have some results for us that we can then use to try and campaign against this increasing, you know, and damaging, degendering view that's taking hold? Sure. Look, there's two things. One is... Yes, a bit there. Um, okay. Sorry, what was your last comment? Well, I don't want to preempt what you're going to find from unpacking okay. the ABS data, but I presume it will be very important for us in Australia to fight this degendering angle. Yeah, look, there's two things. One is um, I am commissioning the ABS to do some further analysis of the personal safety survey. I'm conscious, though, that it may not tell us much. It may not help us adjudicate this debate about women's and men's experiences of domestic violence for a number of reasons. Um, that high rate of refusal, intimate terrorists and their victims may have refused to take part in the survey. And the data about controlling strategies, about injury and fear, may just not be good enough for us to um, make judgments. So for example, one thing I know is lots of the data about partner violence is about the most recent incident. It's not about your experiences of violence in general. It's just asks, what was your most recent incident of violence? Oh, it was by a partner, or oh, it was by a stranger. And so you get a little bit of data on partner violence, but it may not necessarily allow those kind of comparisons. But I am definitely doing that, doing that and I'll be doing that in the next two months. The other thing I wish I had done two years ago, when one in when the one in sorry three years ago when the one in three campaign began and the one in three website went up. Um, the other thing I'll be doing is producing a series of fact sheets, fact sheets based on the literature that review the debates about fear, about control, about severity of violence, and so on. And basically, spell out in a good, accessible way what the scholarship tells us. And I'll do that very much as a political. Um, a political critique of Men's Health Australia and it's one in three website. I wish I'd done it two years ago and I'll be I'll be doing that too in the next two to three months. Do we have a question from anywhere else outside of Mackay? We can come back to this audience. <coughs> 
Hi Heather, it's um, Brisbane. I have a question. It's Deb Walsh here from um, UQ. Hi Deb, go ahead. Uh, my, Michael, thank you for your talk. Um, I just want to say I, I get increasingly worried about the currency that situational um, violence or Johnson's categories are, are, in my view, being alarmingly taken up. Um, you know, to, to call domestic terrorism or um, how he refers to it um, a, as true violence and situational um, couple violence um, somehow less than that. It, it really does concern me. As a practitioner for 17 years, I've had loads of experience, as have others, that people and women report, you know, experiencing over years situational couple violence as, as it's described by Johnson, but who, who also live in absolute fear and who, in my case, um, I worked with a woman who ascribed those sorts of experiences but was ultimately murdered. So I just worry about that currency becoming, you know, um, yeah, seen as the way to categorise violence, whereas we need to, to still, I think, look at violence on the <coughs> continuum and hear from women their experiences and that be the true determination rather than the two um, or three categories. Yep. Look, I agree with that last point and um, you can imagine the ways in which these categories might be used quite carefully and strategically by a perpetrator or a perpetrator's lawyer or indeed as a kind of normalising or excusing by a victim um, as a way of diminishing you know, the realities of that violence. So yeah, there's a danger. There's a danger with this kind of typology. I mean, I think it's a danger that Johnson himself is aware of and he constantly urges us to pay attention to exactly those dynamics you've described of control, of power, of fear and so on. And alongside Johnson's work, there's also work by Evan Stark, his work on coercive control. And I haven't done my homework yet to figure out how these two go together. But Stark says we have to get away from a focus on physical aggression. He says we should be focused on coercive control, which may not involve physical violence at all. Um, I mean, that's kind of summarising him too simplistically. But I, I think there's work to be done in starting to kind of get back to what the problem is. And the problem is harm. The problem is the harms that women and sometimes men experience. And the problem is the threats to their liberty, their freedom, their well-being and so on. We have to get back to the sense in which domestic violence is a, is a political problem, an ethical problem. Um, and so I think simplistic adoptions of these categories, yeah, will be risky and will we'll neglect women who are at real risk and will fail to address the realities of the violence, particularly that women experience. So this stuff is, in a sense, is dangerous. I think if we don't do that, if we start, stick with a kind of one-size-all approach, we risk other dangers. And one of them is that people in the community in general in Australia find it hard to believe that one in three women is the victims of domestic violence, you know, that kind of claim that I and others have made. And one of the reasons, I mean, the reasons why people in the community don't believe that women are one in three victims are partly because there's tolerance for domestic violence, we think women ask for it, women lie about it and so on, and they're, they're bad reasons. But one good reason is that I think people in the community, in fact, are aware of, to some degree, the complexity of women's and men's experiences of violence and want to, um, in a sense, this, this gives us a language to start to name those, uh, name that compl complexity, name that richness. But look, I agree, there are dangers um, in, in these kinds of typologies. We've got time. Sorry, somebody's coming in there. We've got time, I think, for one more question from an external side, maybe one or two. I just want, I'm just um, in Bundaberg. What is the likelihood of perpetrators accepting an order to be involved in a perpetrator? perpetrators program under the new DB legislation when they have to accept the conditions and once they've accepted them there appears to be no consequences for them. Um, I'm going to hand over to Heather for that question. <laughs> well it, it's, it's probably Michael's um, not Queensland based so uh, that's a very specific, specific question about the new legislation in Queensland which provides for voluntary intervention orders so the court can make an order, but the, the respondent has to agree to the order being made. Yep. And then if they don't turn up to the um, to the program, there's no real consequence <coughs> except that it may be taken into account if they then breach the order. So they might end up with a higher penalty. Um, so that, that's the question. Do you want to answer the question? It's, um, 
<laughs> Look, I, I mean, I don't know that I can answer the question. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's problematic for a number of reasons. And, and in fact, there's a concern that uh, respondents won't accept a voluntary intervention order because of the likelihood if they don't if they, if they don't turn up, or if they turn up and they don't successfully complete or whatever, and then there's a breach that that will be taken into account and they might end up with a higher penalty than they would had they not agreed to a voluntary intervention order. So I think, you know, it's hard to know without it being, it doesn't come into practice until the 17th of September. So we've got no kind of practice experience of what's going to happen there at the moment. Um, and I, th I think there are a number of questions about that, but yeah, we, sorry, I, I'm not in a, I'm, I'm, I think Michael and I are probably in the same boat. I mean, I know about more about the legislation, but not yet how that's going to play out. But definitely there are some concerns about uh, the implications of that for it being a voluntary order. Will there be some research about that when it does come into place? Uh, it, it certainly is one of the uh, issues that's been flagged as, um, you know, to, to be monitored in the evaluation of the legislation that will occur. So it's, it's certainly on the... Um, the radar of the Domestic and Family Violence Strategy Implementation Advisory Group, which reports the Minister in which I currently chair. But we've certainly raised that as one of the uh, key aspects that needs to be monitored um, in the uh, implementation of the legislation. Anyone? Okay, we, we have passed our um, the time, but we usually get a, a, something to tell us that the, we're going to lose our connection. So we've probably got the connection. Sorry. Oh, okay. Well, we've, we've we've got people probably need to go, and, and I know we do. But we've, um, I, you know, I can take one more question from an external site, and then we might move to the Mackay audience. Okay. Can I say my email address is up on that last slide and the, and the slides, um, I know you can't see the slide at the moment, but the slides will be available from the Queensland Centre's website. And my email address is up there deliberately so that if you want a copy of the talk or of you know, the reports that I'll write as they come out that I can do that. I'm promiscuous when it comes to media and networking, so feel free to write to me. Okay. Thanks for that, Michael. Well, we, we might now go to the audience here in Mackay to see if there are any questions or comments. Michael, no? hey, would you um, expand a little on the politics around men calling themselves like the pro-feminist versus feminist? Have you got your microphone on, Therese? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can I expand more on the politics of men calling themselves pro-feminist as opposed to feminist? Yes. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, um, I'm trying to knock that over. Um, there's debate. There's debate both among men who are supportive of feminism and among feminist women who welcome men's support for feminism. Debate over whether men should call themselves feminist or pro-feminist. In fact, there's even debate with the term pro-feminist. Should, should it be hyphenated? Or not, you know, should it be pro dash feminist or pro feminist? Um, I've had long debates over this. Look, I don't think these things matter very much. I, you know, I, what matters more to me is that um, we encourage men to support feminism and that men have a vital role to play in building gender equality. For me, that's a, I suppose, an article of faith. Um, I use the term pro feminist, not feminist, because I think that there are some political dangers um, in men taking on the label feminist, that it can imply that. Um, I have the same access to women uh, as women to the kind of sense of what it's like to live as a woman and to the, a knowledge of you know, gender inequalities. Um, it can be a kind of colonising gesture, um, kind of taking over, and so I use the term pro-feminist instead. But certainly some of the most radical feminist women around, some like Andrea Dworkin, uh, you know, radical feminist anti-pornography campaigner, said men, men can be feminists. So it's not, it's not that there's a universal position or that men who say feminist, not pro-feminist, are somehow less feminist. Um, but so what matters to me is that we call ourselves, is, is that we take up support for feminism, um, whether that's pro-feminist or feminist. But yes, for me that's the argument for using pro-feminist, that it's, it's kind of a, a respect for feminism as a, as a movement by and for women while assuming that men have a fundamental role to play. Else? They're all the shy in here. I know. Well, I feel like I, you know, um, it's a terrible metaphor, but kind of battered you into submission with 40 minutes of <laughs> theory, um, particularly because I had slightly more material than um, 
than 40 minutes allowed. And so I don't know if you noticed, but I sped up at the end, which is never good. It was bad presenting. You know. Paul, thank you. Thank you for that. Michael, um, thanks for your... Thanks for um, all the information you gave us. Um, I just wondered if you've done any work with um, uh, same-sex couples, um, Indigenous couples, um, non-English-speaking background couples, you know, the, the diversity. Sure. Look, um, the, because this talk focused on the personal safety survey data, I said very little about domestic violence, for example, in same-sex relationships. And that's partly because the numbers of same-sex same -sex couples in Australia is small enough that a survey like the personal safety survey doesn't pick up um, many um, of the same-sex couples in which there's domestic violence, because that's a, you know, a smaller proportion again. But certainly there's lots of research on... Uh, domestic violence in lesbian and gay relationships, and certainly, you know, when when anti-feminist men say feminism's ignored women's violence, I think, well, hang on, way back in the 80s, they were talking about lesbian domestic violence, you know, conferences and so on. So it's just just a lie. But um, there's debate about that too. Some studies suggest that the patterns of domestic violence are similar. For example, in uh, heterosexual, in women's heterosexual and women's lesbian relationships, typically they're using conflict tactics scales again. Others say that, no, there are some different dynamics. That, for example, a woman living with violence by a female partner, that female partner may uh, use the threat of outing her and the kind of strategies to do with heterosexism and homophobia as part of the kind of strategies that are going on. So I think there's valuable research there. I'm no expert in it, but um, there's good research there. Um, in terms of Indigenous, uh, indigenous domestic violence, and there's a whole lot one could say about the particular character of domestic violence, and in fact violence in general, in particularly rural and remote indigenous communities, which I've not done. But I suspect that if we focus, say, on male victims of domestic violence, um, I don't know if I've got time to say this, but um, I can't remember what I dropped and what I didn't, but there's some evidence that male victims um, of kind of more severe forms of violence by female partners, there'll be more of them proportionally in rural and remote indigenous communities than in metropolitan areas, and typically that's in the context of kind of violence both ways. So kind of situations where, so I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but in WA, for example, the metropolitan hospitals see very, very few male um, men presenting with domestic violence injuries, but the rural and remote hospitals, the Indigenous Medical Services and others, see a few, and often those men, at least according to police and service providers, are themselves also perpetrating violence, and so they're involved in mutually violent relationships where there's high levels of violence and they're you know, kind of flailing each other with star pickets and so on and the men turn up with injuries and the women do too sometimes. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of complexities when it comes to sexuality, to um, ethnicity um, and I mean I and others have said for a long time, oh domestic violence crosses all classes and communities. That's true, but it doesn't cross them equally. Um, I think we might leave it there, that sounds like... It's my mum, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, once again, Michael, thank you very much. It was a really incredibly well-presented um, summary of the, you know, quite complex literature. So, again, I want to thank you for doing that. Um, and as I said, the, the PowerPoint will be available on our website and there will be a DVD available. And I can tell from the, the kind of comments and the questions that people have had that um, this will be a resource that will be well utilised in our um, community sector up here. So thank you very Great. much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.